Dance producer Bilkis Hijaz was charged under the Minor Offences Act in September 2015 for releasing yellow balloons at an arts festival attended by then Prime Minister Datuk Sri Najib Tun Razak and his wife. After three years of legal wrangling and court appearances, the case was finally put to bed. It set in motion a long-running court case which has just ended. Um, how do you feel about that? Very relieved, um, especially for my lawyers. They were doing all the hard work. Lawyers so. for liberty, right? Yes, lawyers for liberty, that's correct. Yeah, I'm glad that it was settled the way that it was. I think it's the best possible outcome. Okay. And, and what, what motivated you to, uh, to um, carry out such a gesture? Uh, I guess I was just extremely frustrated. Um, it was the day after the fourth birthday, I believe the 38-hour birthday, where there were hundreds of thousands of people on the street. Yes, yes, part of the Merdeka Day in 2015. And yes, it was, and so this, my action happened on Merdeka Day, and I just felt that it was extremely frustrating to be in a position where there had been so many people protesting against the Prime Minister, and then he could rock up and be the guest of honour at this art event, happy as you please, as if nothing had ever happened, as if, you know, nothing was weighing on his soul, apparently. And I felt like if we, as the arts community, didn't make some kind of gesture of resistance, or at least gesture of awareness, uh, we had lost an opportunity. And I felt also that the arts community is res more responsible than other communities to be po politically aware and politically active, and often is. And I felt that for us it was kind of shameful to let this happen, for us just to kowtow to someone who many of us believe to be deeply corrupt and not at all deserving of guest of honour status. Okay. And did the election results three months ago feel like some sort of indication as well? Yes, a great deal, although I think, you know, my action had very little to do <laughs> with the election results, but at the same time I was very pleased to see the outcome and I think if my action had, you know, any small influence on any one single person mm -hmm. to make them think differently about the influence that, you know, the ruling party used to have on our lives, I think then, then it was a positive outcome. Yeah. In Malaysia, we're quite used to um, to art being a little bit uh, timid sometimes. I think a lot of it has to do with maybe funding coming through the government, and so art, uh, art, art, and artists are not usually very political. Uh, mm, I would you? dispute that actually. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, what do you think of people like Fami Reza and and Zuna? Oh well, they have. All of my respect. I think um, I don't always agree with everything that they say and do, but I think they are very brave. And especially compared to my experience, I mean, I was in a kind of win-win situation. I was facing a hundred ringgit fine. Found guilty, hundred ringgit fine. Pay the fine and go home. You know, who hasn't paid a hundred ringgit fine in their lives? But they're facing serious jail time. Mm -hmm. And Zuna especially has a wife, has a young family, and these are very, very serious charges and potentially extremely serious outcomes. And so for them to step up and do the things that they did was hugely brave. Are you optimistic that now uh, um, with the new government we won't have this sort of uh, scenario in the future? <laughs> um, I think we should definitely be holding our government to account. Do I think that this is never going to happen again? Of course not. We don't just turn the corner and keep going and ride off into the sunset happily ever after. That's not how this works. Democracy is a process and it's going to take a long time. For the politicians who've just stepped up to the plate, it's a very steep learning curve and I think a lot of them aren't going to make it, to be honest. It's, it's a lot to expect of them. They have huge expectations riding on their shoulders. They cannot please everyone, that's just impossible. And we are going to be disappointed at some point and we are going to have to make our disappointments known to the government. A long time ago you were a student in Harvard and uh, did you ever imagine that you might best be known as Balloon Girl? Mm. Which yes, which is kind of something that now I have to live down I think more than anything else. No, at the time I wasn't particularly politically active. Um, I was watching Reformasi from the point of view of being in America and not really being able to take part in it, which is sort of to my enduring disappointment, I guess. Um, my sister, my older sister, who was also at Harvard before me, um, was always much more politically aware than I was. And I think it's thanks to her that I ever became aware of the various social injustices happening in our society. Um, because I think as Malaysian students, we're not really privy to these conversations. Um, one of the classic remarks that came out of this was when your father 
I was interviewed and he said, oh, I wish, I'm very proud of her, I wish I had dropped the balloons myself. Did that come as a surprise to you? It came as a great surprise, <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, my father is someone who, you know, as many people know, has done fairly well from uh, the status quo. He's an extremely successful architect and his work is, is well known in the community. For a long time, he looked upon certainly my sister's political activism and then later my own political activism as something fairly distrustful full, something that he wasn't really prepared to commit himself to. But I think as it became more and more apparent that the powers that be really were deeply corrupt and indefensible in their behavior, he began to swing more towards the side of thinking that yes, these people have to be held accountable. Um, what sort of hopes and aspirations you have uh, for the art scene in, in, in the coming mm. years? I would like to think that the government will come up with a more structured response to issues of censorship. I know that censorship is always going to exist in some shape or form. There is no society that has no kind of restrictions on the things that you can say and do. Um, but I think it's important for our government to be very clear about what those limitations are to be clear about who has the authority to, for example, shut down an exhibition or to call for works to be pulled out of an exhibition. What is the process? What is the process of appeal for the artists? What exactly are the things that are allowed and not allowed? So that we can all be very clear about what the framework is and what the SOPs are. Because when it is vague and a gray area, that's when the powers that be sometimes get to impose their view and sometimes get to sit back and let you do whatever you like. And for the artist, that's when it requires the artist to self-censor. And that is the most dangerous thing. If you're censoring yourself to a known criteria, that's not self-censorship. It's when you're like, oh, well, I don't know if this will be allowed, so I'll try not to do that because it might not be allowed, but I'm not sure. That's when it becomes very, very dangerous. It's not so different from journalism. It's not so different from journalism. <laughs> I think there are quite a lot yeah. of yeah, crossovers here, actually. Yeah. At any point in the last few years, have you regretted it? You thought, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that? No, um, because I felt like, actually, the symbolic impact that it has had has been beyond my wildest dreams. Mm -hmm. I could never have imagined that so many people would get to know the case and that so many people would write to me with expressions of sympathy being like, I'm so horrified that the government is choosing to spend its limited resources pursuing this, you know, junk case. And I think, yeah, you're exactly right. But I, you know, I'm amazed actually by the train of events that I put into motion with this very small event. And I could never have imagined that they would have happened. For me, it has been the best possible outcome in all ways. Um, I think I was very lucky. I had, obviously I had a very minor charge. I had free legal support, which many people don't have. I had the support of my family. I'm not taking an enormous risk. I don't have children. I don't have a husband. I don't work for a government agency. And um, I had a lot of support and coverage from the press. And without any one of those things, this would have been a, com a very different experience. Um, but I did have all of that, so for me it was an overall entirely positive experience. At the moment, my only sort of sense of apprehension with this event is that I feel like there's a great risk that I will go to the grave as the balloon girl, and I think that would be <laughs> a little sad. Um, also the kind of infantilization of girl, and it's always the balloon girl, it's never the balloon woman, um, is a little problematic. But if that's the worst thing that happens out of this event, then I feel like I've got off lucky.